I think almost everybody has found their table. I, th I think. There we go. Well, another year has passed, and I have the privilege once again of saying good evening and a very warm welcome to each of you. This is the 25th year of the Tyler Prize, and I'm delighted to say this is possible because of the foresight and generosity of John and Alice Tyler, who had a recognition and concern of the environmental challenge long before the movement became popular in any quarter, government, industry, or wherever. And um, I'm Bob Sullivan. I'm the chairman of the Tyler Prize Executive Committee. And let me start by part of Alice Tyler's family, who's with us this evening. And it's always a special pleasure to welcome them. Uh, Alan Brown and his wife, Courtney, are you all? Thank you for being here again. We appreciate it very much. Anders Brown and his wife, Monica. Where are you? And Marilyn Tyler and her son, William Mansour. When John Tyler first established the Tyler Prize more than 25 years ago, part of the initial charter and the plan was to establish an executive committee. And the executive committee has three major responsibilities. First, we're the stewards of the resources for the prize. We manage the, the funds of the prize and the general management of the prize and, and what have you. And secondly, we try to fulfill what we know to have been the desires and the intention of Alice and John Tyler on a perpetual basis. Uh, we have the privilege of getting to know them pretty well and knowing their vision of the future, and we take that very seriously. But third, and by far the most challenging, is to sit several times a year and select the Tyler laureates. <coughs> This is an interesting but difficult process. Why? Because we get so many wonderful nominations from around the world. And we sit in a conference room in this hotel, many, many files and folders, many, many hours. And invariably, it leads us to very, very distinguished international scientists who we'll talk about a little later. So that's what the executive committee does. And it's always a pleasure for me to be able to introduce those people. We've all become, we've become good friends and close colleagues. And first, let me introduce Mr. Frank Clark. Frank is a member of the very prestigious law firm of Parker, Milliken, Clark, O'Hare, and Sibelian. And Frank was the personal attorney for Alice Tyler and became very close personal friends. To this day, he's the general counsel of the Tyler Executive Committee and the Prize, and he's a trustee of the Tyler Perpetual Trust. Frank, please stand up. Don't be so modest back there. Uh, Bob Frosch joined the uh, Tyler Committee when he was then Vice President of Research at General Motors, and he is now a, sen a Senior Research Fellow at Harvard. Where's Bob? Bob, thank you so much for your help. Arturo Gomez Pampa is a 1994 Tyler Laureate, and he's a professor of botany at the University of California in Irvine. <laughs> Owen Lind is one of the three charter members of the Executive Committee, going back to 1972, and since that time he has served as a chairman of uh, the committee secretary since its inception. And he's a professor of biology at Baylor University. Owen, where are you? There he is. 
Uh, Dr. Jim Maloney was the personal physician to Alice Tyler. He also established the surgery department in UCLA, and he is now the Lewis Beaumont Professor Emeritus of Surgery at UCLA. Where are you, Jim? <laughs> Ralph Mitchell is a charter member of the Executive Committee and the Gordon McKay Professor of Applied Biology at Harvard. Ralph? We Unfortunately, Sally Ride is not with us this evening. On her way up from La Jolla today, she had an automobile accident. Fortunately, she was not hurt, but it did put her car out of commission. But she sends her regards to all of you. Walter Rosenblatt has been a charter member of the committee again since its inception. And Walter has brought to the committee a very special touch of wisdom, charisma, and insight that has been so invaluable to us. He joined the committee when he was a provost at MIT, and he's now a past institute professor at MIT, by far one of our very favorite people and somebody we all admire and respect. And please join me in a very special welcome to Walter. Uh, Sherry Rowland is a 1983 Tyler Laureate, and further, he is a 1995 Nobel Laureate. He is currently the Foreign Secretary of the National Academy of Science and the Donald Bren Research Professor of Chemistry at the University of California, Irvine. And to the members of the committee, I express my sincere appreciation for all your help on a continuing basis. I bet you're wondering where the food is. <laughs> it, it won't be long. Uh, we have some past laureates with us, and we're absolutely delighted. First, let me introduce Steve Frank, the President and Chief Operating Officer of Southern Cal Edison Company. Steve, representing Southern Cal Edison. <laughs> Paul Crutzen, the Director of Air Chemistry at Max Planck Institute in Mainz, Germany. Thank you. Paul is also a 1995 Nobel Laureate. Thank you for coming all this way, Paul. <laughs> Baruti Galdikis is the president of the Orangutan International, and she's traveled from Indonesia to be with us. And last year she was with us, and we awarded her the prize. And Baruti, we had lunch with her today, is a wonderful person doing fantastic work. Baruti, where are you? I can't see because of the light. And Gary Hartshorn is the Executive Director of the Organization for Tropical Studies at Duke University. Gary, thank you for being with us. <laughs> Finally, the privilege of introducing a very, very special uh, person. The Tyler Prize is a joint venture between the Executive Committee and the University of Southern California. And over the years, we have had an occasion to work with the administration of the university. I'll talk about some of those people a little later. But Steve Sample has gone out of his way to give the prize the recognition and the stature that we hope the university would do. He's also become a special colleague and a dear friend. And he's here with us this evening as he comes every year. And I'm going to ask Steve to please come up and introduce the university and some colleagues. Thanks for your help, Steve. Well, I want to uh, welcome all of you on behalf of my wife, Catherine, and on behalf of everyone at USC to this wonderful evening. As you know, since its founding 25 years ago, the Tyler Prize has become a premier international prize. The reputation of any prize depends not only on the prestige of the organization awarding it, but also on the quality of the recipients and the importance of their contributions. 
the 44 people and two institutions chosen as Tyler Prize laureates over the past quarter century have been truly exemplary environmentalists. Each of them, in his or her way, has added to the prestige of this prize. I want to congratulate the Tyler Prize Committee for their outstanding selections of Tyler Prize laureates. It's been their focus on quality that has helped propel this prize to the top ranks. Their choices have made the Tyler Prize, according to our distinguished guest, Nobel laureate Paul Crutzen, the environmental prize with the highest reputation worldwide. The committee's record of honoring only the best is confirmed by this year's Tyler Prize laureates. Anne and Paul Ehrlich are superb ecologists and population biologists. And they are also outstanding communicators who have, who have informed a generation of people around the world about the hazards of environmental destruction caused by overpopulation, species extinction, and the threat of nuclear war. Catherine and I congratulate both of you, Paul and Ann, on the 1998 Tyler Prize. Mrs. Tyler turned to major universities across the country in search of members for the Tyler Prize Executive Committee. And after tonight's dinner, three of the founding members of that committee, from Baylor, Harvard, and MIT, will speak about the prize from their perspectives. The prize's peer review process has also been enriched by members of the business, legal, and medical professions who have served on the committees. We're pleased that Mrs. Tyler turned to USC in 1980 for assistance in generating nominations and administering the prize. It's an honor for USC to work in partnership with the executive committee in this process. It's my pleasure now to acknowledge several educational leaders who are with us this evening. First, Kumar Patel, who is Vice Chancellor for Research at UCLA. Kumar? Ralph Cicerone, who right now is Dean of the School of Physical Sciences at UC Irvine, but who is also, ladies and gentlemen, the Chancellor Designate at UC Irvine. <laughs> Chancellor. Jeff Dozier, Dean of the School of Environmental Science and Management at UC Santa Barbara. <laughs> Neil Sullivan, Vice Provost for Research at USC. And a very special guest, Jared Diamond, who is Professor of Physiology in the UCLA School of Medicine, who just won the Pulitzer Prize for General Nonfiction. <laughs> See, we, uh, we're very ecumenical here. We uh, recognize all these prizes. I'm also very pleased to welcome Jim Powell, President and Director of the Los Angeles County Museum of Natural History. And Ann Muscat, Deputy Director of the new California Science Center. Where is Ann? Uh oh, don't clap then if she didn't come. <laughs> but do see the new Science Center if you haven't already. After dinner, Professors Owen Lind, Ralph Mitchell, and Walter Rosenblith will conduct the award ceremony and give you some insights into the history of the Tyler Prize. Meanwhile, enjoy your dinner. Thank you. Good evening one more time. Of course, the highlight of the evening and the reason we're here is to make the Tyler presentation. And as I mentioned earlier, the presentation will be made by the three charter members of the executive committee. And to get the process started, I'm delighted you have an opportunity to listen to Professor Walter Rosenblatt. Thank you all, and particularly I would like to say my colleagues from the founders of this group, and also, of course, the man who is the chair tonight, who is Bob Sullivan. Well, 
there doesn't exist a real history of the Tyler Price, but there deserves to be one, and I'll finish my short remarks by saying that we should somehow do this in a serious way. The booklet you have in front of you has made a step in that direction, but I think it is too short a step. You, we ought to have something more, because we cannot count that 25 years from now the same people will still be sitting and remembering what happened. And I think one doesn't have to be afraid that this has to be too elaborate a matter and that it has to cost too much. The thing that it needs to do is to convey the spirit of what the Tyler Prize meant in its early period, and as the prize ages, we need to be able to make our history age too. So let me start out by saying that this booklet that you have in front of you is a good step in that direction. And it has a summary of some of the aspects of the way in which the prize was developed. And then it has also some of the biographies of both John and Alice Tyler. And of course, those of us who knew them at the beginning and have a particular feeling towards these matters. And that's hard to convey in a history, either short or longer. But you may ask yourself, how did the several selecting, selection mechanisms come into being? I can't give you a complete as account of that, but I'll tell you what I know about it in the sense of what I either knew directly or indirectly and heard about it. The Tylers had originally decided that they wanted the prize be selected in a manner that was, came from private institutions. And so private academic institutions were selected. And I can't tell you how they were selected, but I can tell you who they were. And you can see in the program today how, who they are today. I remember that then Governor Reagan called MIT's President Jerome B. Wiesner and asked him to serve on the selection committee. Jerry Wiesner agreed that MIT would like to be represented on that committee, but he said he was too involved in MIT affairs to be a member of the committee directly. So he says, let my provost do that. Now that meant me. <laughs> and that's the way I came into this matter, and I came out here for the first time in the early 70s. And at that time, we found that the institutions that had been selected originally were Auburn, Baylor, CIT, California Institute of Technology, Harvard, MIT, Purdue, Scripps Institution of Oceanography, the University of Southern California, and later on, this would of course change as the people either aged or had other conditions that prevented them from continuing it. But there was an institutional basis and that institutional basis turned out to have a leader. And the leader was Dr. Omar Farid, who was a person who knew Alice Tyler, and I think was in some aspects her physician. And Omar was a person who had worked with a uh, foundation and he was really the, the spirit of the way in which the Tyler Committee got going. And I think his, he had a feeling also for how people could interact. He had partly that feeling from the tennis connections that he had, 
from the medical connections that he, as a physician, had, and from the fact that he had worked with some developing countries. And I will never forget that when we went for the one presentation of the Tyler Prize to Nairobi, and the president of Nairobi, who is still the same guy who has just been re-elected for the 75th time, <laughs> that uh, that man said, well, you can't have this man present at the presentation. And Omar, stood, who was a very mild person, stood up and said, well, if you want me to be here, you better have him here coming too. And Omar was in some ways our leader and the glue that kept us together. Later on, the role was shared by a variety of people, and Frank Clark came into a, sit into a situation where he played part the role of, together with Omar, as of the leader and of the glue. So here we are at the beginning, and I must say, how did people pick this area? I have no particular wisdom about this, but obviously today we know that environmental achievement is something very broadly di distributed among the various disciplines, and it is something that we have international conferences about and all of these things, but at the beginning, after the Second World War, the atomic bomb certainly played a major role, and then came molecular biology in the early 50s that played a major role. But the other thing that we have to, thank you very much, I appreciate your uh, teaching me that I should hold the microphone closer so that people can hear me. Maybe it's better if they don't hear me, who knows? But the fact is that after we had seen and dealt with the problems that had many disciplines involved, like the atomic prob uh, bomb problems and like the problems of molecular biology, we came into a situation where smog seemed a major problem. And I remember that in the first meetings that the founders got together on, there were many people who were nominated for the prize because of what could be done to get rid of smog. That was the big issue that seemed to be there. But as we went along, there was a lot more. And of course, today, yes, Frank, what are you signaling me? Should I talk louder? I don't think you will necessarily like it. <laughs> but the fact is that I think as a group, the executive committee of the Tyler Prize has been a group of people who have worked together harmoniously and have been led through difficult periods like the transfer of the matter that of where the prize was going to be administered. And as the president of SC told us earlier, they are happy to have us here. Earlier, we, the prize was being administered at Pepperdine. And I think that we felt less supported there than we are here, obviously. Here we have a group of people who work hard and give us the necessary data and the necessary background. And we have the agreements that come out of the meetings of the executive committee. I think that I would never have believed at the beginning that it would go on like this for 25 years. But I think there were people who worked hard, both on the staff and on the committee, and on the committees, and today you have a group that represents a broad, rep broad set of disciplines. And I feel that if we want to have the Tyler Prize continue and be up to date with what today's 
issues of environmental achievement are. We need not to have only a history, but also a future. And I'm happy to say that the two people who are getting the prize tonight are part of that future, and very importantly so. So I shall stop here and let my colleagues give you some less accented English and under the circumstances also give you some of the other aspects of the founding fathers. Thank you, Walter. Um, I should say uh, in the beginning that we owe an enormous debt of gratitude to John and Alice Tyler for their vision in beginning this prize. It's hard to think that it was 25 years ago that the Tyler Prize was initiated when in the popular um, uh, mind uh, the environment was not at the forefront. People weren't thinking about environmental deterioration 25 years ago, but the Tylers were. Uh, they were very concerned about uh, the deterioration both of our national environment and of the global environment. I personally didn't have the privilege of knowing John Tyler, but over the many years that I and other members of the executive committee have interacted with Alice Tyler, we were just so wonderfully surprised time and time again by her reminding us, our environment is in danger, gentlemen. In those days, it was only gentlemen. Gentlemen. Um, it was only men. Yeah, well, <laughs> so, some more gentle than others. <laughs> Alice, Alice's view was, uh, you better stick to it and make sure that we make the public aware uh, that we have major problems, uh, both in our nation and on our, uh, on our planet. And I'm happy to say that today the Tyler Prize is accepted throughout the world as the preeminent award for achievement for the protection, both of our nations and our planet's fragile environment. So, it's almost 40 years ago um, that Rachel Carson explained to us the hazards to life on Earth by our blind allegiance to technology. Uh, she articulated uh, that view so strongly that she really if, is, if you like, the mother of the environmental sciences and the environmental movement. Since that time, no group of scientists has done more to understand this danger than the ecologists. That is, those individuals studying the complex interaction between plants and animals, and we include among the animals humans, and the biosphere. The Tyler Prize has honored a number of outstanding ecologists throughout these 25 years. They include Ruth Patrick from the Philadelphia Academy of Natural Sciences, Peter Raven from the Missouri Botanical Garden, E.O. Wilson from my own university, and Arturo Gomez Pampa from the University of California, who is now a member of the Executive Committee. All of these individuals were willing to spend much of their time and energy in addition to their work on their science explaining to the general public the consequences of ignoring the hazards to humans and our world's biodiversity from environmental deterioration. I know that John and Alice Tyler would be very pleased and proud that two of our nations and indeed the world's outstanding ecologists, Anne and Paul Ehrlich, are the 1998 Tyler laureates. They have done so much to increase our awareness of global problems, population, resource depletion, and environmental deterioration. The prizes this evening will be awarded by Dr. Lind. It's my honor and privilege to invite Anne and Paul to come.
come up here to receive the 1998 Tyler Prize for Environmental Achievement. Twenty-five years ago, the first John and Alice Tyler Ecology Award, as it was called at that time, was presented to a group of three individuals who represented a broad spectrum of environmentally based ecology. There was Evelyn Hutchinson. He was recognized for laying many of the foundations of basic ecological theory upon which effective environmental action and management have to be based. Also was recognized was Ari Hagenschmidt for his exceptional research science needed to understand the cause of a very specific environmental problem, the photochemical smog that was previously mentioned. And also awarded was Maurice Strong for leadership in shaping global environmental policy, without which all of the excellence in theory, science, practice really accomplishes nothing. On the occasion of that first prize, the former astronaut Harrison Schmidt wrote, based on his observations from Apollo 17 and referring back to a very famous Life magazine cover photograph that some of you may remember. If there ever was a fragile appearing piece of blue in space, it's the Earth right now. That lonesome marbled piece of blue with ancient seas and continental rafts is our Earth and will be our home even as men travel the solar systems. The challenge is to both use and protect that home together as a people of the Earth. If successful, historians of the solar system may someday say of those people, referring to us, that this was their greatest act. On that first occasion, a stone from Africa was adopted as a symbol of the Tyler Prize. It was adopted because when it was cut and polished into this little sphere, it so much resembles that appearance of Earth as seen by Dr. Schmidt from his tiny vehicle in space. I ask you to look at it. Pretty tiny, pretty insignificant. It's true, isn't it? I can easily put it back in my pocket. Yet how similar it is to our Earth in the frame of the cosmos. Very tiny, very insignificant. Nevertheless, for us, it's our home. If those solar system historians are someday to write of us with favor, it will be because of the efforts of many people. Yes, the scientists, the engineers, the technicians, the makers of policy. But perhaps most importantly, they will write of those solid citizens of planet Earth who, when informed, when informed, demanded and obtained revision in a manner by which human can, humankind both views and uses its home. No two individuals have been more influential in this process of environmental awakening than the honorees on this special occasion of the 25th Tyler Prize for Environmental Achievement, Anne and Paul Ehrlich. Anne and Paul, you were early, and you've been consistent in your concerns and in your communications to us, both scientist and layperson. Last week, my wife, Lara, who, like you, Anne, is also a colleague of mine and works as an ecologist. We were having dinner with a gentleman in Texas, the director of the, what I'd probably consider Texas's principal academic program in environmental science. And he was just finishing graduate school when your famous book, The Population Bomb, appeared. I asked him how the writing of the two of you had affected him, or what should I say about you tonight? He thought about it for a moment. He said, it's really very simple. Just say that first you made me think, then you made me act, and in fact, I went out and had a vasectomy. <laughs> So Anne and Paul, you have not only made us think, but you've made us act. And it's with great enthusiasm that we present you this special prize on the anniversary, the 25th year of the Tyler Award for your excellence 
and your performance in all areas of ecological science. Congratulations. Thank you very much. This is an enormous... Oh. <laughs> Good idea. Well, there is another one here. Or maybe that's something else. I don't know. Well, anyway, not only is this a huge honor, a tremendous honor, and we're extremely gratified and pleased, but I must say, I, must, I would thank the committee not only for giving us this great honor, but for welcoming us into what seems to be a very warm and friendly and very generous family. You've made us feel completely at home with your hospitality and, and kindness. So thank you very much on all of those counts. Well, we wouldn't be here but for a good many friends, colleagues, former students, and many others who've helped us along the way, who've contributed to our studies one way or another over all these years, and uh, a few of them who deserve special mention I would like to uh, discuss, but they run into dozens, if not hundreds, so obviously I can't name them all. If you don't hear your name, it's not because we don't appreciate you, but, but because the list is too long. So first and foremost, among our friends and colleagues who made major contrib contributions to our work is John Holdren, who is now at Harvard. He was our close collaborator in early work, uncovering the relationships between environmental deterioration, population growth, affluence, and technology. We first met John when we'd been at Stanford for almost a decade, and he was a graduate student in plasma physics. His big contribution to our joint work was what he brought to it as a physicist and an engineer, understanding that technological side of things. During 25 years at the University of California at Berkeley, he became one of the world's most distinguished analysts of energy, the environment, and nuclear arms control. Today, he's a major advisor to President Clinton and Vice President Gore, working tirelessly to design a sane energy strategy for the US and to keep plutonium from turning up in unfortunate places. In 1995, he accepted the Nobel Peace Prize on behalf of the Pugwash Conferences on Science and World Affairs. He was, at that time, the president of their council. <clears throat> In recent years, we've been collaborating closely with Gretchen Daly, who is now the Bing Interdisciplinary Scholar at Stanford. Together with us, she's been struggling for a decade with issues ranging from how ecosystem services can be preserved in landscape architectural in agricultural landscapes to how increased equity can help raise food production and reduce birth rates. Besides John and Gretchen, we have, as I said, hundreds of other collaborators, students, colleagues, friends, people in other disciplines or our own who have contributed special insights or ideas to our work. Many of them have been part of Stanford Center for Conservation Biology. And tonight, the center is represented here by Scott Daly, Gretchen's brother, who is a graduate student working at the interface of the business community and the environment. And of course, we're grateful to all of the members of the center. Needless to say, most of our work and our group's work 
would not have been possible without the generous support of many, many friends. The whole list, again, is much too long to read. But we must mention Pete and Helen Bing, who many of you know, Larry Condon, John Gifford, Max and Isabel Hertzstein, and Stanley and Marion Hertzstein. The latter two are here tonight. Stanley and Marion are our special friends, as well as having been benefactors to our work. And the late Lou Esther Mertz, who was our first major benefactor and was always at our side when the going was tough in the early years, always with a joke or some cheery remark to lift our spirits. We both miss you constantly. Lou Esther. Thank you. I'm going to set the bezel on my watch because I've been told to hold it to an hour and a half, and I don't want to run over uh, lest Bob have a heart attack. Uh, this is uh, an occasion, I think, for sentimentality, perhaps even for getting a little maudlin. Uh, the, the thing that strikes me more than anything else about this evening is a sense of continuity, uh, both personal and professional. Personal because the uh, Tyler prize has gathered together a very large group of the women who mean the most to me, not just Anne, uh, but my mother, who's here and will be 91 years old tomorrow, uh, my, my sister Sally, who spent her life overseas mostly uh, struggling as a UNICEF officer to try and make the world a better place. And I like to think it's a better place because of her, but you didn't quite do the job, Sally. There's still a bit to do. Uh, and uh, a representative of uh, our mob of granddaughters. Uh, we have uh, uh, three of them, but it was Jessica who was willing to take time out of her busy schedule to come out here and represent uh, the family. And it's great to have you here, Jessica. And also uh, a very, two very special friends, George and Yvonne Burtness, who have spent many years not just being supportive, but going into the field and doing miserable, dirty work for us in the tropics as volunteers. And I mention them especially because uh, they've known my mother for many years. Uh, she, Yvonne, shares a birthday with my mother, the 18th of April. And they have, the two of them, although they've known each other for years, have never been together on their birthdays. And tomorrow is the first time. Of course, Yvonne is 40 years younger than my mother. But nonetheless, uh, they're going to share the birthday. So that's, the, that's part of the personal side. Uh, but there's also a feeling of great continuity uh, on the professional side, too, because uh, I counted it up. And Anne and I have personally known 23 of the previous 36 individual winners uh, and admired all of them, known of all of them, of course. Uh, and Evelyn Hutchinson was already mentioned. Of course, he's an enormous hero uh, to all uh, ecologists, I would hope to all biologists. And uh, uh, if we're a band of brothers, the group that's been trying to ch make these changes in the world, he certainly would have been the leader of the band. Uh, we were never fortunate enough to know Charles Elton, but another enormous hero. Uh, Gene Odom, Ruth Patrick, uh, still see Ruth all the time, expect to see her in Washington next week. But when I was a kid at the Academy of Natural Science in Philadelphia curating their butterfly collection, she was already uh, a well-known phenomenon uh, in the area. And I suspect she'll be a well-known phenomenon long after I have shuffled off this, uh, this mortal coil. And most of the other people uh, that you've heard mentioned here, again, are people uh, that we have known and worked with. Uh, Paul Crutzen and Sherry Rowland and Mario Molina are special heroes uh, of ours. Uh, I think they may just have bad luck because they've chosen to work in the atmospheric sciences. And I used to think that the people you had to deal with when you were interested in population were bad. Uh, but if you can see the tricks that are now pulled by the people who are trying to prove that uh, we don't need an ozone layer after all and that global warming is going to be good for you, uh, it, it would shame a gorilla. Believe Sorry, Baruch, I didn't mean that. It would shame a gorilla. Uh, Baruta reminded me today, I hadn't remembered that I met her when I was an old man and she was a graduate student at Gombe Stream more years ago than either of us would care to remember. But uh, if you hadn't had a chance to talk to her about what's going on in Southeast Asia and if you've got any way to help, by all means do. We're all going to try. Uh, I 
had my biggest experience with the with the uh, with our closest relatives, actually even closer than orangs, chimpanzees, in starting to work with Jane. Uh, at, we had Jane Goodall into the human biology program at Stanford, and Anne and I began research at Gombe Stream. Uh, and uh, uh, I have to tell you one story. Has everybody finished eating? <laughs> I got to tell you a Jane Goodall story, uh, but I don't do it when anybody's eating, and that is. Uh, the most astonishing thing I think has ever happened to us in the field happened at Gombe Stream, and that is while we were there uh, working on a butterfly mimicry complex, and we were about to leave, a female chimp from another group wandered into the uh, area occupied by the home group, and as was their custom, a bunch of males attacked her. She had a baby. They threw her to the ground and stomped her, and the baby was injured, and the males took the baby chimpanzee, killed it, ate part of it, they were about two miles from the camp. And then, according to the observers who were watching, seemed to know they were doing something wrong, end quote. And they took the half-eaten baby and walked it two miles and left it on Jane's doorstep. Now, I'll leave you to interpret this particular piece of animal behavior. That was only the start of it for us, because Jane said, Professor Masangi in uh, DAR, uh, autopsies, all of our dead chimps so we can get our hands on because they want to know what the parasite loads are and so on. Could you take the baby chimp back when you fly out tomorrow uh, and give it to Masangi and he'll autopsy it? Obviously we said, of course we will. So we had the, I think it was five or six hour boat ride down the lake and we waited for three hours for the pilot to come in the Cessna 210 and at that time I was an active pilot and this pilot turned out to be an idiot and he flew us back to Dar underneath the inversion layer so we were in the heat. We get to the Dar airport no Professor Masangi. Uh, it turns out that his father had died and he had to go back to his home, uh, to his home village. And we had been in, in Gombe, which wasn't exactly rich living for some time, and we ended up in the equivalent of the Dar es Salaam Hilton. And we're dressing for dinner, not quite this fancily, but actually with ties, and it dawned on us that the room smelled funny. <laughs> I thought, oh my God, only us. So we put it in the closet, Smell came out into the room. We tried to put it out on the, uh, on the uh, porch. Door was screwed shut. Uh, I said, I'm not going to take this thing out and dump it in a street or a garbage pile because somebody will catch me. They'll think it's a human baby, and I'll spend the rest of my life in the Dar es Salaam pokey. So I go down to the desk, and I say, I am Professor Ehrlich. I want to see the manager. And after some maneuvering, got the assistant manager, and I said, I have a very special biological specimen uh, to, uh, uh, to, that needs to be preserved in a freezer. Can you have, give us some plastic bags? To make a long story short, Ann and I danced between a, a bell, an incredibly uh, curious bellhop while we rebagged the baby chimp and got it finally waltzed off and into a freezer. And I said, honey, we're not having breakfast here tomorrow because I know what will be on the menu. And sure enough, when we went back to get the damn thing, it was gone. Uh, and we searched the hotel from top to bottom and actually found it in a freezer about eight stories away. But that was, I think, maybe the darkest moment when we realized that we were stuck with this decaying baby chimpanzee. Anyway, so I always remember Jane for that, if nothing else. I haven't seen her for a few years. Uh, Ed Wilson and I did our first political ecology together. In 1958, he recruited me into a campaign to try and stop the United States Department of Agriculture from spraying the entire southeast of the United States with pesticides to get rid of the fire ant. And as any ecologist could have and did tell them, the last thing they were going to get rid of was the fire ant. Needless to say, they didn't listen. Needless to say, they did it. Needless to say, they got rid of everything but the fire ant, as those of you who live in places like Texas uh, still know. But uh, uh, it was a lot of fun to start out with Ed. And in uh, 1990, I guess, we shared the Crawford Prize, which was very nice, the two of us uh, uh, getting together after all those years, uh, having started the battles together uh, so long before. Uh, M.S. Swaminathan, another uh, uh, Tyler laureate, uh, is a, a long-term acquaintance and friend of ours. We had a wonderful time in Tamil Nadu with him, by the way, one of the places where you can see how it is possible to lower birth rates and take care of people better in countries that are much poorer than the United States. The job can be done. It was absolutely incredible, for instance, to watch the educational programs that they have for their children. Uh, in that state, in India, around Madras, uh, they had some years ago the first um, governor of the state 
who had not been born in uh, who had not been born rich, who was poor when he was born. Oh, everybody else had been from the aristocracy, and he announced when he got in a position that there weren't going to be any more hungry kids in Tamil Nadu. And he instituted a school lunch program, which we saw, in which they get a hot, highly balanced, nutritious lunch in the school. And if any kid shows the slightest sign of malnutrition, uh, a special supplement is sent home for dinner. They had educational. Uh, the kid, we had eight and nine year old kids starting into trig uh, in their thing. They had a wonderful um, uh, program for literacy, their literacy rates going way up, and their birth rate, like in Kerala, had come way down. In fact, I suspect now both Kerala and, uh, uh, and Tamil Nadu have lower total, total fertility rates than the United States. And Swaminathan, of course, had not just a hand in that, he had a hand uh, in, the, in feeding the people of Asia big time. I should point out, by the way, that when the rich people got back into power, they couldn't end this program. It's an interesting thing about politics. Once you get something like that in place uh, and it works, there's no way of going back. And so that looks like it's going to continue uh, essentially permanently. Now, another Tyler Laurie, Tom Eisner, Ann and I first met in 1956 in Vienna. And I'll always remember that in 1960, uh, when we worked, all of us, at the Southwest Research Station, Tom had a wonderful recording of a beautiful voice, wonderful singing, and he convinced Ann and me that it was Maria, his wife. It was only about a year later we found out it was Joan Baez. Now, Tom and Peter Raven, yet another Tyler Lariat, and I talk to each other on the phone a lot. I'd like to tell you it's about really deep scientific things, but mostly we exchange jokes. The most recent one to go around, I've been given permission to tell, is about the, uh, the man who goes up to an attorney and says, how much do you charge? And the attorney says, $300 for three questions. The guy says, isn't that a bit steep? And the attorney says, what's your third question? Uh, so uh, that I think originally, I can't remember whether it originated with Tom or Peter, but we keep it going and you're all now in the loop. Uh, Peter and I have done an awful lot together. Uh, one sort of weird interesting thing is that we've only published three joint papers and we both believe those are the three most cited papers either of us have ever written. So we think maybe the, our brains have grown together a little bit too much, but we're trying to separate them with alcohol, so not to worry. Now, uh, the Tyler is obviously a very good time to think about old comrades and old friends, but it's also, I think, a time to look a little bit into the future. And let me say some really cheery things, the things that have impressed me most, the most hopeful thing I've seen on the academic scene uh, in the uh, last decade is the growing coming together of first-rank ecologists and first-rank economists. It all started back in 1970s when Herman Daly was a voice in the wilderness, but now uh, people like even Ken Arrow, the Nobel laureate, Partha Dasgupta, who is the president of the Royal Economic Society and simultaneously the European uh, Economic Society, Carl Jaren Mahler of the uh, Bayer Institute of the Royal Swedish Academy, uh, people like Larry Goulder in our economics department, Wally Falcon and Roz Naylor, both ag economists at Stanford. We work together all the time. I have joint postdocs. I've had about five with Larry working on ecological economic problems, and Partha and I now have uh, a paper in review in which we basically say ecology and economics are the same discipline. It's come a long way from the days when everybody seemed to be at loggerheads uh, over this, uh, over, uh, you know, ecologists thinking one thing and economists thinking another. Uh, I'm not mentioning here the editorial pages of an otherwise fine newspaper, the Wall Street Journal. You can still find economists who will write pretty silly things. Uh, and at Stanford, a group has come together that is collaborating in this direction and has been extraordinarily uh, supportive of us, uh, people like uh, Pam Matson and Peter Vitusik and Hal Mooney, who many of you have heard of, and Joan Roughgarden and uh, Mark Feldman and Carol Boggs, all working in a way towards goals which just wouldn't have happened uh, 20 years ago. You've all heard about Jared Diamond, one of the great heroes of ecology, uh, getting a well-deserved uh, uh, Pulitzer Prize. But you should know that he's been one of the main people fighting to save biodiversity, along with other people who aren't here, like Stuart Pym. Working with all these people has just been an incredible pleasure. And as I say, if we're a band of brothers, it's been a great band uh, to be in. Finally, uh, Ann and I just came back from the Las Cruces station of OTS, uh, where Gary Hartshorn is here tonight representing OTS, which was a, uh, a recipient of the Tyler Prize. Uh, 
We were there, I was there, and had already returned when we heard about the Tyler Prize, and the first thing we did with our newfound affluence was uh, offer a challenge grant uh, of $5,000 towards money that we're trying to raise to, to be matched. We're trying to raise money to take a small chunk of pasture adjacent to the largest remaining piece of tropical forest in the area, about 200 hectares, uh, and uh, buy the pasture and then try and reforest it so as to expand the forest. And I'm happy to say uh, that that grant turned out to be matched by $45,000 through a series of things, and the pasture is now purchased and things are going forward. The rest of the money we're going to spend uh, to support uh, the work that we do, and right now it's going to go, for instance, part of it into uh, what Gretchen Daly calls countryside biogeography, trying to figure out uh, how you can maintain agricultural intensity uh, without getting rid of the biodiversity that's so critical to supplying pollination services, pest control services, and so on, to s sustainability of the agricultural enterprise. That's what a whole group of us, including my graduate student mafia, have been working on in Costa Rica. And another big thing which Ann and Carol Boggs are uh, shotgunning uh, is trying to keep after the people who are producing lies about the state of the environment. And I must say that they give us material to work with almost faster than we can deal with it. The most recent being, the, the, the latest, for those of you who haven't heard, is they've managed to start forging uh, reprints from the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. They, if you didn't see this week's science, they circulated uh, a, a thing that looks like a reprint from the PNAS but turns out to be a press release formatted to look like the PNAS. And when asked for the explanation, they said, oh, we thought scientists would be more comfortable reading things that were in the form uh, of a PNAS article. Yeah, sure. Well, let me tell you, as you, I think, know, uh, Neither our efforts nor uh, people like Sherry's and so on have been without the, uh, uh, the slings and arrows that come along with it. But I think, like all scientists, uh, we tend to stand or fall in our own uh, egos and our own opinions on the basis of the judgment of our peers. And obviously, uh, something like the Tyler is an enormous boost there, makes us feel very good, uh, especially important to us for that reason, and uh, from both of us, our profoundest thanks very much. Before we close for the evening, there are two people here I'd like to invite to join me just for a moment. Jerry Walker and Terry Ziegler. Come on up, come on up here, Terry. And Jerry, come on up here. Terry and Jerry are at, at USC, part of the Provost staff. And they are the unsung heroes of the whole Tyler movement. They're very patient with us, put up with a lot of nonsense, are always there to help us, and we never say thank you enough. So on behalf of everybody here, one more time, thank you. Thank you, Bob. We really appreciate it. Thanks for being with us. It's always a pleasure. Hopefully we'll see most of you next year. Thank you very much.